Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House and to another edition of our Conversations at Noon. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here at the Old State House, and we're really excited about today's program. It's part of a month long celebration of Connecticut's Freedom Trail here in Connecticut. And as many of you know, the Old State House is actually one of the 130 sites on the trail that celebrate the achievements of African Americans in Connecticut. As many of you know, the room we're sitting in, the building we're in, was the uh, site of the opening hearings of what became known as the Amistad Trial. Today's program, Reimagining Ways to Preserve the Past, stresses the importance of preserving historic sites that highlight the achievements and experiences of African Americans. This program is being recorded by the Connecticut Network, and our program today will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Diane Smith. Diane is the Connecticut Network um, Senior Producer for Program Development. She's an Emmy Award-winning journalist and a New York Times best-selling author and truly one of Connecticut's treasures. Please join me in welcoming Diane. Thank you for coming today. What do we as a society choose to save and to protect? This building, the Old State House, is a good example of preserving a building that figured significantly into the history of our state and, in fact, into the history of our nation. Not all places that are worthy of being saved are as grand and beautiful as this one, but they do help us tell our story as people. Here in Connecticut, we have the Freedom Trail, which consists of sites in more than 50 towns sprinkled across the state, sites that tell us some of the story of African American history in our state. We're going to hear a little bit more about that a little bit later in the program. But far too many sites that reflect the history of African Americans in this country have been lost. There are some unique challenges to saving these sites, as we're going to hear from our speaker today. Brent Legs is working to save diverse historic places, ranging from schools to a stadium to the homes of exceptional people who were standouts in the arts, in politics, and in business. And there are lessons to be learned and inspiration to be drawn from each one of these places. Brent is the field officer in the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Boston office, where he developed the Northeast African American Historic Places Outreach Program, and where he authored Preserving African American Historic Places. He leads project teams that are protecting nationally significant historic places, including, among others, John Coltrane's home, Joe Frazier's gym, and the mansion that Madam C.J. Walker built. In the past three years, Brent has worked with 55 organizations and 350 individuals and secured over a million dollars for preservation projects. Please join me in welcoming Brent Legs. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited to present the good work that we've done at the National Trust over the last few years. But before I get into my presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about the National Trust. We were founded in 1949 to be the nation's leader in historic preservation. We are involved in advocacy, education, provide technical resources, and our real mission is to secure the past to enrich the future. We have a signature program, which is our National Treasures Program, and right now we are taking direct action at 35 nationally significant historic places in the United States. I will showcase a couple of these places in my presentation. And the effort is to maximize the resources of the trust, to save nationally important places that are endangered, and to use that to uh, inform and educate the larger preservation movement. So to learn more about these national treasures, you can visit our website, which is www.savingplaces.org. Now I have the great fortune of working for a wonderful organization that has allowed me to be innovative and to dream big. And as you heard, we've accomplished a lot of great work uh, over the last four years, which has been really exciting. And the goal has been to build a regional preservation movement. What I have wanted to do is to intersect 
historic preservation in business, and to bring innovative financing strategies to nonprofit organizations that are saving places that are important in African American history. Because the real goal is to achieve long-term financial sustainability, not only for the project, but also for the organization. Now, the concept of freedom, it's really timely that we're having this presentation and discussion today. This right here is the 16th Street Baptist Church. As you all know, uh, September 15th, 1963, uh, 50 years ago, this is the site of a tragic bombing that took the lives of four girls that really was a catalyst for advancing civil rights legislation of 1964. So we're commemorating this important place and this important day in history. But we're also celebrating Dr. King's uh, 50th anniversary of his amazing speech, which is, I have a dream. And then of course, this is also the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Act. So th this year uh, is a lot to celebrate. And the concept of freedom continues to be as relevant today, not only in America, but all across the world. So what is historic preservation? To you, it might mean the sustainability and, and greening and retrofitting historic buildings. It might uh, include uh, preserving historic buildings on a main street to uh, revive uh, failing downtowns. But for me, historic preservation is really a platform to present examples of excellence in American history, and in particular in black history. And I think that we can do this by revealing examples of, of excellence in historical themes besides slavery. So this includes entrepreneurship, civil rights, arts and culture, sports, education, and more. And one of these places includes Frederick Douglass's Cedar Hill. This is in Anacostia, Virginia. Now, African Americans have always, over our, our history, have always been preserving historic places. But we did this in a real informal kind of way. So every time we donated to the church's building fund to uh, save our historic churches, we were doing preservation work. Every single time that we uh, mowed grass at a historic cemetery, we were saving an important, important cultural landscape. And every single time our families gathered together at the family farm to celebrate June 16th, which a lot of you uh, probably are aware, this is generally when African Americans around the United States celebrate the emancipation and our freedom. We, when we come together, we are honoring our past. But we've moved past that. So the first organized effort to save African American historic places in the United States took place here at Cedar Hill. So the National Association of Colored Women in 1922 raised $20,000 to save this site, which many of us consider uh, Black Mount, the Black Mount Vernon. It's such an important place because, as you know, Frederick Douglass was really the first icon in black history to be recognized and to have such a prominent voice and to be that, that, that presence uh, to be able to uh, confront and his disdain for American public policy. So I want to uh, read the mission of the National Association of Colored Women because it's relevant uh, today to restore it, Cedar Hill, to its former beauty that we may make of this historic place a hollowed spot where our boys and girls may gather during the years to come and realize hope and inspiration and encouragement to go forth like Douglas and fight to win. I think that's just such a beautiful statement. And it's really the reason that I care about saving places. But of course, more needs to be done. So only 2% of the listings in the National Register of Historic Places, which has entries of over 87,000, only 2% directly reflect African American history. There are 2,500 National Historic Landmarks in the United States, and approximately 7,000 of those reflect the black experience in America. So there's much more work that needs to be done to identify, document, and preserve these important and significant places. Booker T. Washington's The Oaks. 
I think this is really the first example. Uh, the Oaks was constructed in 1899 by the first African American graduate of MIT, Robert Taylor. Um, this is the first example that I'm aware of where an African American uh, assault professional architect to design their historic residence. And as we all know, Booker T. Washington is amazing, not only just in black history, but really an icon in American history. And if you've ever read Up From Slavery, then you would be as moved as I was when I read that um, to want to support and touch his vision and his dream. And I have been able to do that, and you can do that as well, by visiting a historic Rosenwald School. So Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald came together to create a school construction program, and together they helped to construct over 5,000 schools in 15 southern states. And these were the most architecturally advanced school plans in the United States, and they were for African American kids. And just a personal note, I had the good fortune of doing the statewide inventory in Kentucky in graduate school, and I realized that my mom and dad went to Rosenwald schools. And then I could then touch physical fabric that connected my family to Booker T. Washington. I was sold on this idea and the power of place and the power of preservation, but I also discovered that a lot of historic places in black history had totally been erased. Entire communities had seemed as if they had vanished, and only foundations uh, of a church might, might remain. So of course, if we don't act to preserve places, we're losing our history. Now this is one of my favorite projects right now. This is Madam C.J. Walker's Villa Larrero. Now, most African American historic places are small, they're unadorned, they're simple buildings, but this allows us to celebrate an architectural masterpiece. But not only that, the Guinness Book of Records uh, acknowledges that Madam Walker is the first self-made female millionaire in the United States. She did this being a cosmetics pioneer and business entrepreneur. It's, it's just remarkable, her story in her life. She says, I am not satisfied in making money for myself. I endeavor to provide employment for hundreds of women of my race. And she did that by employing and training over 30,000 women. Villa Larrero today. The gentleman in the corner is Vertner Tandy. He was a co-founder of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated first African-American to be a member of the American Institute of Architects. He himself is super important in, in the history of design, and in particular, black design. So here's an interior view. I mean, look at that detail. It's, it's spectacular. That's the front entrance. This is the music salon. Could you imagine being in there? They had an estate organ that was worth $25,000 at the time. This place cost $250,000 to construct, and she intentionally built this right down the street from the Rockefeller Brothers, which is three miles away, and from Jay Gould's Landhurst. She was a strategic business lady in every move. Here's some of the beautiful historic lighting fixtures. I think this might be the first swimming pool that's constructed by an African American in the United States. I can't verify that yet, but I think it uh, potentially uh, could be. And then this is a, a rear view of the house. And there she is in 1912 in her car. I have built my own factory on my own ground. She is the only F, uh, female or only person that I'm aware of that has two National Historic Landmarks uh, uh, designated in her honor. So the villa and then the Madam C.J. Walker Theater that's in Indianapolis. All right, so some Connecticut sites. We have the Amistad, which you heard about uh, earlier, which is such an important um, uh, story, and saving not only the ship and this place to be able to, to uh, inform the public about this concept of freedom uh, and civil rights is, is strategically important. But then there's the Mary and Eliza Freeman houses, and we have Maisa Tisdale, who I've been working with for years, and we provided some funding through our partnership with the 1772 Foundation to uh, stabilize the building uh, here on the right. And the story here is really about entrepreneurship. So Mary and Eliza are two sisters. They lived in New York, lived and worked in New York City, and they became real estate investors. 
In, 19, in 1848, they bought property, this property and the one next to it, and other property. And it's pretty amazing how women, even before Madam Walker, were being so entrepreneurial. It's just a beautiful story. Then we have the National Civil Rights Museum. How many of you have visited this place? Mm. We're going to have to change that. Because the experience that you have when you go to this place is profound. And you walk away changed and, and a different person. And you learn so much about the civil rights movement. And of course, Lorraine Motel is where Dr. King was assassinated. But they use this place to interpret the broader story of the civil rights movement. Sweet Auburn is a national treasure of the trust. This is, was known as the richest Negro street in the world at one point in time. It's also the neighborhood where Dr. King uh, was born. But the historic uh, residential part has been designated and protected, and so it's thriving. But the commercial district is, is struggling, and so the National Trust is bringing resources to try to figure this out. And Joe Fraser's gym. Anybody that is a sports fan can remember uh, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier and, and the controversy that uh, uh, was around them both. But Joe Frazier was such an important person. If you get a chance, uh, uh, view the recent documentary, documentary on his life, When the Smoke Clears. You get to see how much he cared about people in his community. I mean, he was a real activist for disadvantaged youth, and he used this as a safe haven. So it's not only where he trained, but it's, it was really a, a modern-day community center. And our effort here is we designated it locally to protect it, and we've also listed it in the National Register. Hinchliffe Stadium. This is one of 188 baseball venues in the United States that is directly associated to Negro League professional baseball. It's the only one that's designated a National Historic Landmark, which was achieved in March of this year. The National Trust is working with a coalition of preservation groups and stakeholders to initiate a $1.5 million stabilization effort there. And a lot of momentum is, is moving behind this project. But as you can see, Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby, who was the second African American to integrate uh, baseball, he integrated the uh, 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 Cleveland Indians three months after Jackie Robinson. And then just some sites in Philadelphia. We have worked in Philadelphia uh, since 2009, uh, advancing efforts to stabilize the John Coltrane House, the Marion Anderson House, the Paul Robeson House. I mean, just this collection alone uh, can present uh, a positive image and help to reconstruct a new identity uh, for African Americans in, in Philadelphia and nationally. Project Row Houses is another place. If you get the publication Preserving African American Historic Places, you'll get to see a case study about uh, Project Row Houses. And I show this because this is, is the intersection of art and preservation to be able to be used to revitalize a blighted neighborhood in, in, an, African -American, in, a, in an African American neighborhood. And it's just amazing. They acquired 22 shotgun houses for about $122,000, brought together some artists to think creative, creatively and, and outside of the box, secured some foundation and partnerships, and have transformed this part of Dallas, or this part of Houston. All right, so a lot of the issues, of course, is lack of funding and the lack of sophistication of organizations saving places. So two sites, the John Coltrane House here, on the left was listed to the 11 most endangered list in 2010. Uh, the next one uh, was recently listed this past year, which is the Abyssinia Meeting House, which is in Portland, Maine. So we're working to advance projects there. All right, so take the tour. There are three amazing heritage trails in New England. There's the Connecticut Freedom Trail, of course, which is very special. There's the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail, which is amazing. And then there's the Black Heritage Trail that's in Boston. Uh, if you get a chance, tour these places, uh, support the organizations that are doing this great work. And I just want to give you a little background on how the Portsmouth has be organization has transformed into more of an advocacy group. So in 1799, the New Hampshire legislation legislator received a petition from 20 Africans 
asking for their freedom so that, in quotes, the name slave may not again be heard in a land gloriously contending for the sweets of freedom. Now, the legislation, of course, deny this because of to uh, delay the ruling to a more convenient time. After 234 years, the governor this year signed a bill into law giving them their freedom. It's a beautiful story. So in closing, how can you help? You can become a member of the National Trust. You can sit on a board of an African American historic site. You can provide your expertise. Uh, your resources, your time, uh, or you can just go and experience these places and learn more about it and share it with people in your community. The Preserving African American Historic Places publication, if you uh, 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 click this link, then you can access that publication online. There's some hard copies in the back. And then feel free to email me at blegs at savingplaces.org uh, for a hard copy or to access the online version. And just finally, in closing, I want to share a quote that, uh, for me, sums up uh, this idea of excellence in, in black history. This is by Charles Gar Gar Garnier. To see and to make oneself be seen, to understand and to make oneself be understood, that is the fated circle of humanity, to be actor or spectator. That is the condition of human life. So I'm hoping that our work to save African American historic places showcases the black community as actors, that we are a community of agency, that we contribute to the advancement and development of the United States, and that we also have examples of excellence in history. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Levine. I am the coordinator for the Connecticut Freedom Trail under the Department of Economic and Community Development. And I'll be very brief. I'm just as excited as you are to hear about the panel discussion on African American historic sites. Uh, but I want to share with you briefly just a little bit about the Connecticut Freedom Trail and our plans for the future. For those who, of you who may be unfamiliar with the Connecticut Freedom Trail, I wanted to briefly just uh, read to you our mission statement. The Connecticut Freedom Trail documents the struggle towards freedom. This trail designates sites that celebrate the struggle for justice and equality that continues into the 21st century. Sites depict the efforts in all their forms of the state's African American community and all the communities that champion the goals of universal freedom and human dignity. So the Connecticut Freedom Trail, in partnership with the Amistad Committee in New Haven, was established in 1995 by the Connecticut General Assembly. When the program was launched in 1996, there were 60 sites in 30 towns, including this very site, the Old State House. The early years were met with great enthusiasm and energy. The, the Connecticut Freedom Trail was all over the media, including national attention. We hosted numerous exciting events every September, which is Connecticut Freedom Trail Month, to celebrate the trail and unveil new sites. And most importantly, the Connecticut Freedom Trail was in our schools. Unfortunately, in the recent years, that enthusiasm has waned. The good news is that the state of Connecticut and the Department of Economic and Community Development has rededicated itself to the Connecticut Freedom Trail. This September, we have more events than we've had in a decade. We unveiled our newest site to the Freedom Trail on September 7th, the Lyman Homestead in Middlefield, which honors the Lyman family for their anti-slavery activities. Today, there are more than 135 sites in 52 towns. We have a smartphone app that's in a work for early next year. Uh, but if you can't wait to learn all about uh, all the sites on the Freedom Trail or want to learn more about the events this month, you can go to our website, which is ctfreedomtrail.org. Now, our biggest priority for the coming year and the years to come is to reintroduce the Connecticut Freedom Trail to our schools. We'll be partnering initially with the state's HOT school program. HOT stands for Higher Order Thinking. And we plan to partner with other school programs across the state. 
Our goal is to share with middle school kids and high school kids the stories that come from the Connecticut Freedom Trail sites. These stories that have helped shape Connecticut and, in and indeed shape the nation. These are powerful stories, stories of courage, of overcoming insurmountable odds, stories of freedom. Our goal is to inspire our kids to greatness. Now, the preservation of Connecticut's historic places is challenging. The preservation of African American historic places is not only challenging, but it has its own set of obstacles to overcome. So at this time, I'd like to hand over the mic to Diane Smith and this panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And joining me on the panel now uh, with Brent is Glenn Cassis, who is the executive director of the Connecticut African American Affairs Commission. The mission of the AAAC is to improve and promote the economic development, education, health, and political well-being of the African American community in Connecticut. And also joining us is Maisa Tisdale. You heard a little bit about her project. You're going to hear a lot more about it now. She is the president and CEO of the Mary and Eliza Freeman Center for History and Community in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Tisdale is a native of Bridgeport and the daughter of two prominent civil rights activists there. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, let me talk to all three of you um, about one general question, which is, and I'll, Brent, I'll start with you, what are some of the unique challenges to saving African American historic sites as opposed to all of the other historic sites in the country? You mentioned it's just 2%. Yeah. Um it's really a grassroots movement, and that's similar to the uh, broader preservation movement, but uh, preservation in the formal sense is still new. So building the capacity of stewards to uh, manage very sophisticated and difficult real estate development projects, mm -hmm. to raise money to support that uh, in the long and short term, to build uh, the capacity of organizations uh, and, and, and bring best, best practices to nonprofit management has been a challenge. And our, our efforts at the National Trust has been to really strengthen and build the capacity of these organizations. Glenn, let me ask you the same question. Yeah, I, I would think that a lot has to do with the way um, the history of African American, uh, African Americans is uh, recorded. Much of it is, is not documented. A lot of it is through language and through uh, tradition and, and carry forth that way. And I think it's sometimes hard to connect the dots and to, um, and to understand you know, um, where the history is and how to build upon it. And also, I think, um, has a lot to do with the transitions that uh, African Americans have had, moving from community to community. Um, things change, uh, demographics change. Um, and when you look at it, um, we haven't been here that long in terms of being settled in, in some areas of, of the country. Maisa, let me ask you about um, how you got involved uh, with this preservation effort in Bridgeport. Well, I was involved very early on with this effort. When we were studying the history of the South End, we were very surprised to find out from the city historian that there had, in fact, been a black community, a black settlement that existed before the end of slavery in Connecticut and before the end of slavery in the United States. And yet these were free black people. They were free. Um, this settlement was, was a, a settlement of people of color. They originated, many of them, here in Connecticut. So Little Liberia, as we refer to it now, called itself Liberia, and was, had been referred to as Ethiop, was established by three people, Joel Freeman, and also two of the sons of Nero Hawley, who fought in the American Revolution and was set free. Mm -hmm. What we found out from more recent study, it looks as though this community intended to establish a free city for people of color, even during slavery. And they didn't care how you got there. You could come on the Underground Railroad, which the community has ties to. You could come because you were a seaman and working as a sailor. You could come um, because you were already free, but in, in this community, Liberia, you would have the ability to use your God-given talents to support yourself. Your work would support yourself. And that act, that act of revolution, is something that is mind-boggling. So with 95% of their, of their brethren in shackles, 
this community was saying, we're free. If the US isn't free, if Connecticut isn't free, this community in Bridgeport South End, our Liberia is free. Lisa, how did the larger community in Bridgeport and in, in Connecticut look upon this community? Oh, well, it's kind of interesting. First of all, we get on 95 or we go down Broad Street and we just drive to this community. But it was really isolated at the time. A lot of the area around it is landfill, so it was surrounded by water. It also had this entanglement of marshes behind it. And also the white people felt it was an unhealthy place to live. If you got there, you'd get malaria and you didn't want to get in water because who knows what would happen to you. So they were living in, in somewhat isolation. So what happened is they had access to this area by sea. These were men who um, largely were sailors. If you look at the, the census data of the time, their professions were seamen, seamen, seamen. Because black men were disproportionately represented among seamen during this time of tall ships. It was the one place where black men could make as much as white men and be free. So they carried news, they carried cargo, they carried other people from place to place. They brought their money home. The women invested it, the women had businesses, and you saw this community grow. But I, I do want to say a point. I'd like to answer their question mm -hmm. as well. I think one of the reasons why black um, sites have such a hard time surviving is that the communities they exist in are marginalized, and they don't have a lot of political power. So there would be many, many more black sites of historic um, significance if they weren't already in cities and they hadn't been destroyed by urban renewal. Mm -hmm. So there's a constant battle, not just to restore your site, but to actually keep your whole neighborhood from being demolished or um, from things like you know, sewer plants and power plants mm -hmm. being located right next door. Yeah, you make a really good point. And Glenn, um, we've seen the major cities in Connecticut in particular, I'm thinking of Hartford and New Haven, um, being the targets of uh, 1960s urban renewal. And I wonder how much we know of the communities that disappeared here. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, again, it, it, a, lot of it, a lot of it's not documented. A lot of it's oral history. Um, people talk about uh, you know, where it used to be and how this was there and, and whatnot. And we haven't really documented. I, I just want to point out the fact that um, you know, we're looking towards education as a, as a press, uh, educational system as a way of, of doing this. And I know there's some good examples of that. I know in Hartford, um, for a while, uh, at Fox Middle School, uh, one of the teachers there, uh, Billy Anthony, used to do a project with her students where they would go out in Hartford and look at uh, various sites. Uh, they did a project I remember on, um, on uh, Horace Bush, excuse me, um, Horace uh, Wells uh, and his efforts in terms of, uh, he was a dentist and he was involved with uh, 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 anesthetic for using it. They have a park area over there. They did a research on it. These, stu these students did this and this was, uh, this was enlightening for a lot of folks who didn't really understand or knew about Horace Wells. These kinds of efforts could ha happen and I think that's what needs to happen more often. And he's considered really the father of anesthesia. Father, you're right, yeah. exactly. Um, I, I thank him every time. <laughs> 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 but there, there are instances like that and I know the common core standards that have been adopted by the state allow for uh, students to do research projects and they can build on those projects and those are the kind of things we need to look at in terms of, of making that connection. Well you give me a perfect transition here. I'll interrupt um, our discussion to bring um, some students into it. Um, these are students from Simsbury High School. If I can have you stand up. Uh, they are working on a project uh, about Martin Luther King's time in Connecticut and uh, they really kind of accomplished quite a bit already. Um, Grace, so would you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you've been doing? Sure. Um, I'm part of the Martin Luther King Connecticut group. Um, my name is Grace, and this is Kavya, and next to me here is Stephanie. Um, we three are part of the student committee of this group, and we're um, currently trying to build a memorial to commemorate um, Dr. King's time since their campaign. However, a couple years ago, we made a documentary um, that unveiled uh, a lot of information that was previously. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, that was previously um, unknown to the community in Simsbury. Um, Dr. King spent two, Sims, or two summers working in Simsbury at the tobacco farms. 
Um, and these, the, his time at Simsbury really changed his perspective on um, civil rights and because he had grown up until that point down south where there was um, lots of segregation. When he came to Simsbury, he experienced a different type of community and he felt more included in, in, um, in the, the, the town as a whole. And um, so we created this documentary and we got a lot of press. It was covered by the CBS News and also by the Associated Press. Um, Grace, tell me what you're trying to do now. Um, we're currently trying to build a memorial in Simsbury that is kind of a second step to this, this um, documentary. And we're building it right in downtown Simsbury, part of the uh, Simsbury Historical Society. Um, we're trying to raise $100,000 to create this memorial. Um, we're currently a little bit, almost two thirds of the way there. Um, so Great. We're, we're working towards it and hopefully gonna start building towards the end of this school year. So, if someone wants to make a donation, is there a website that they can go to to get information? Yeah, um, there's, our website is www.mlkinconnecticut.com and um, it's got lots of information more about the project. It has our documentary is actually up on the website. Great. Um, and there's lots of information on how to make a donation or buy a brick, which is a smaller donation that goes actually onto the memorial. Okay, thank you so much. So um, that's a great project. I just want to offer her additional resource. I love this idea of this intersection between art and, and place and how art can be used to commemorate history when there's no physical fabric there. The National Endowment for the Arts uh, has a program called Our Town. They provide $150,000 grants uh, just for the purpose of a project like yours. I think it's March 1st is the deadline, National Endowment for the Arts, up to $150,000. Grace, I think you need to get on that. <laughs> Glenn, I think it's interesting that um, Todd said, you know, the, the Freedom Trail had so much excitement when it first got started and then it sort of waned and now trying to get it back into the schools. Um, it seems to me that that ought to be an integral part of school curriculum and that, you know, visiting the Freedom Trail should be high on the list of school trips, field trips. Yes, and I think it's all around us. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's something that should be done. I think we can do it. And I just want to give you an anecdotal story about the, that documentary on Martin Luther King that uh, Simsbury students mm -hmm. did. I was showing it to my granddaughter. Uh, she's at the time seven years old, and she was watching it, and she looked at it and says, and she calls me Poppy. She says, Poppy, that's the church that we go to, because part of the documentary featured uh, Dr. King going to Union Baptist Church, which is on the uh, Freedom Trail. Uh -huh. So those kinds of things, you know, by having that as an educational aspect, brings kids together, and I think it will be really enjoyable for most people to really capitalize on. Mice, mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit more about um, the center now. Um, you talked about uh, what was known as Little Liberia or Liberia. What about these two um, women, the Freemans? Uh, Mary and Eliza Freeman were Joel Freeman's sisters, and they were of mixed heritage, of Pagusset and African American heritage. And they lived in Derby. Um, they, their parents lived there, and they didn't leave there until um, their parents passed away. And that's actually when their careers came to life. They came and they bought, the, bought property in Little Liberia, and then they worked in New York City. They actually commuted and worked as chefs. So they acquired money on their own. They actually invested it. They, did, they gave mortgages to other um, people. Mm -hmm who were establishing themselves in the area. And they actually um, sold money, sold property to the railroad that became Metro North. So they had a good eye for property. I would and say. Putting yeah. money in later on. <laughs> I believe I read somewhere that at the time that one of the sisters passed away, uh, right. she was believed to be one of the wealthiest citizens of Bridgeport. Not just believed to be. The only person in Bridgeport who had more money than she did was P.T. Barnum. They were contemporaries, <laughs> right? They were. It's astonishing, and the fact that uh, so few of us know about these sisters. Well, is again, really... it has to do with the way we write our history here. This whole chapter would have been raised to the earth had if the houses had been demolished. Mm -hmm. And I can't thank the trust enough, and also Charles Brilovich, who. Um, was a city historian, and he just doggedly researched and researched. Our research has continued also. I mean, this is a story that is documented. Mm -hmm. You have the original houses on the original sites made of the same materials. Mm -hmm. um, not only is it documented by the historian, um, there's also a, a doctoral candidate from the University of 
of California, mm -hmm. and her name is Jamila Moore Pugh. She actually also has a grant from the National Science Foundation to um, research Little Liberia and the Atlantic community of Liberia, mm. because it turns out that there were communities with Liberia in their place name in Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, mm. and Africa itself. And so this community, as we study it, might be big, of, a part of still a, a larger picture. We also found artifacts attached for the site, to the site. So for an African American historic site, for it to be documented, have buildings standing, and have artifacts that go from the early 1800s right up to modern times, it's really a gem. So she's really ahead of the curve in a lot of ways because of all of those factors. She is. Uh, having that research is, is really important to make the argument uh, that this place is worthy of preservation. But then also having a, a, a lead advocate like Maisa that has the sophistication and the wherewithal to stay motivated and committed to this kind of project. It really takes a champion to save places, and she's a champion. Brent, it struck me in, um, yes, I agree. Uh, it struck me in reading um, your uh, piece that, uh, that we have copies of here today that um, you said something to the effect of not every site can be a museum, mm -hmm. but sites can be saved and repurposed. Mm -hmm. And you showed an example of that, I think, with those row houses mm -hmm. uh, in Houston. Are there other sites like that? Yeah, Weeksville Heritage Center, which is in uh, Brooklyn, New York, their 40-year history started out as a uh, historical society. And even going back, it's three uh, remnants of a former free black community that was in a community called Weeksville. And so again, they started out as a historical society, realized that that was not a financially sustainable option. They then uh, transitioned to become a house museum, mm -hmm. realized that that was not working as well. So then they uh, uh, created a new strategy where they became the largest arts and cultural institution uh, supporting black artists mm -hmm. in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. And they are really a modern day community center. Mm -hmm. They use their landscapes as an organic garden for the community. They consider themselves a cultural oasis in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. And they really have the largest green space yeah. in that section of the city. Maisa, what's the, um, what has been similar for you for the center in terms of a sustainable model uh, for this? Well, our, our model will be, I think, um, similar to Weeks, uh, to Weeksville, but believe it or not, I worked at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, which is huge. Mm -hmm. It's much larger than our little houses. Yeah. But that idea that they could actually teach and reach scholars that are, were at the very heights of, in terms of um, academia and also reach out to children who are hearing the story of Native peoples for the very first time and have classes that dealt with very basic skills. I think that's something that we will be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to have a museum and an education slash research center mm -hmm. um, play a lead role in the digital humanities through um, the ties with the National Science Foundation that mm -hmm. we have right now. Mm -hmm. And also offer lessons in basic reading to the community of, of Bridgeport as a whole. Bridgeport has a 64% functional illiteracy rate. So being able to teach people how to read will be very important to our community. And I think that there are revenue streams for those kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it. And I think that that's, um, that was something interesting that I was reading about the centers. And I think that, Glenn, um, you know, that's something that has to be overcome um, in saving certain sites, um, that there has to be a sustainable way to keep it going or to keep it preserved. I know that on the Freedom Trail, many of the sites are now privately owned, and you can't actually yeah. go into them. But um, for sites like this, you need to come up with that sort of a strategy. Absolutely. And, and I think we also need to look at uh, different ways of outreaching. Uh, oftentimes, I have gone to uh, historical society meetings and things like that. And you know, although I was born in the 50s, I don't consider myself to be a young person anymore. And, <laughs> and there are certainly more people who are older than I am attending those meetings. We don't seem to have the young people who are you know, buying into this, you know, with the exception of you know, some students. But I think we need to do a little bit more outreach to get younger folks involved with this to carry that on. Um, they need to bring that perspective in. And that's what's going to carry us you know, into the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important.
And Brad, isn't that part of what you're doing and, and part of what I read um, in the piece that you put together is that it's really important to get that buy-in. How do you get that? That's a good question and that's a challenge that all organizations are, are dealing with and confronting because it's how can we be relevant mm -hmm. and how can this history be relevant? The thing that I've noticed is uh, there's an economic value to history and history can be uh, trendy. Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully right now civil rights and uh, that history is real prominent and important. Uh, so to be able to maximize that is to try to build relationships, as Maisa said, political relationships, uh, working uh, African-American churches, and really creating a grassroots effort to uh, uh, build the movement. And just to give you an example of our strategy, we're working with Madam C.J. Walker. We've created a partnership with SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is in Savannah, great preservation mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. And we're creating a multimedia application, almost a kind of a, a mini documentary. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to use this platform, this technology, to engage the next generation mm -hmm. of advocates that will then kind of take on this work. Mm -hmm. so. Does anyone in the audience have questions? I'm sorry, I've been so involved in the discussion, I haven't asked you if you'd uh, <laughs> like to ask any questions. I just want to say how excited I am to hear about what is happening at the Freeman Houses. I have gone to see them, and was I, they are currently in another kind of isolation, shall we say, cut off by 95, in a very sort of semi-industrial area. People, I frankly only discovered it because I was going to the ferry. But that, of course, could become a potential audience for you, because in some ways you're, you're you know, if you can capture some tourists, maybe, I don't know. But I'm so, I remember standing there and thinking about the place and almost in tears, seeing how derelict it looked, but clearly someone loved it by your signs and your fence um, protecting it. So I'm thrilled to hear about your plans. I'm so excited to know that it's really being preserved and to have, have such a wonderful vision for the future. Lisa, how far along are you in the project and where do you hope to go? Oh, okay. Well, we had a really exciting year last year um, with the help of the 1772 Foundation and the National Trust and the Connecticut Trust and also um, the city of Bridgeport. We um, deconstructed the non-historic portions of the houses. And we did that. I mean, our whole idea, and actually I got it when I, I visited Auburn, the Auburn mm -hmm. area in, in Atlanta. Um, and our whole idea is to use the the preservation of the Freeman houses as a catalyst for neighborhood revitalization. So we partnered with the Green Team and also um, Urban Miners from New Haven, mm -hmm. and we trained 16 people who were displaced workers from the area. So they received green construction mm -hmm. skills, preservation deconstruction. We also gave them workshops in archaeology and their hard hat docents, okay? So they can tell you anything about the history or the site. Interestingly enough, they were the ones who found all the artifacts. And um, Nick Bellantoni, the state archaeologist, said that any, anyone else, any other crew would have destroyed them. They brought them up whole and their museum quality. So um, that's where we are right now. We're going to have the state come in because when we took the, it was really amazing when we took the, um, the portions of the buildings down, we realized that the layout of the land was completely different than we thought. One of the houses was U-shaped and had been uh, had an old addition of its own. And so we need to have all the drawings redone, and then we'll just keep on going with the help of our friends. So when you talk about deconstructing, you're taking mm -hmm. off the parts that were added later? Or parts that were later. added in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And these parts were in such bad shape, um, they threatened pulling down the historic parts. But I personally believe that Mary and Eliza built those houses in 1848, the last year of um, the remnants of slavery in Connecticut to make a statement. Their houses were built by architects and they were built really well. In the next century, when the houses were acquired by um, the next owners, they were used to house immigrants and they actually destroyed part of the foundation and built on it. Um, and this, this was the part that was crumbling that was often seen in the, the newspapers. It was actually a modern addition. So we took those down. Does anyone else have questions they'd like to ask or comments they'd like to make about what's happening? Yes. Just a comment. 
uh, it involves uh, Sally Whipple, actually, uh, back when we were both doing something different. Sally Whipple introduced me to uh, a former slave in the town of West Hartford, a slave by the name of Bristow. And I, became, I was on a committee with her at the Noel Webster House. I became interested in this person. I was working at the time and uh, would go to meetings and learn as much as I could. One of the things that bothered me is that Bristow did have a headstone in the town's oldest cemetery right on North Main Street. Uh, the problem with the headstone was that it was not possible to read the inscription. Now, the headstone is part of the Connecticut Heritage Trail. Uh, it was impossible to read the inscription because over the years, the inscription had eroded. And I made a mental note that one day I was going to do something about it. Fast forward from the 1980s to 2000-something, I retired and decided to uh, uh, engage the West Hartford African-American Social and Cultural Organization in a project to replace the headstone. And I won't go into all the details about how, why you do that, but, the, uh, but we did. We, we raised money and replaced the headstone. With the, we knew the, what the original inscription read because I think it was the Daughters of the American Revolution had recorded all the inscriptions in the, in the, in the old burying ground. Uh, so we knew that. So anyway, when you mentioned grassroots effort, this was one of those things that, that I kind of feel proud of, too. We raised money, uh, it, uh, acquired a new headstone with the original inscription on it, and we went through the process of going through the probate court, the historic commission, and God and everybody else to take, <laughs> take the original headstone out, put in this replacement, so that anybody going into this, oh, it's the only African-American headstone in the cemetery. Uh, we know there are other African-Americans buried there, but this is the only one with the headstone, going back to 1814, maybe, Sally? Something like that. But uh, uh, at, at any rate, people coming to the cemetery now can read this. And in and, 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 and his original headstone, it says Bristow in African, so there's, there's no mistake about it. And the original headstone, which is this valuable historic artifact is in one of West Hartford's middle schools. And the middle school is named the Bristow Middle School. After we did all of this work to replace the headstone, a couple of us decided we should petition the town to name the new school that was being built, the Bristow Middle School. And lo and behold, miracles do happen. The Board of Ed voted that this is what the new middle school would be named. So the, head, the original headstone is the part of the school and the students know the story and other kids in the community know the story. So, and, and the, the replacement is still is, is in the cemetery. So for anybody walking by, you now know, uh, you know, the story about this headstone. And when you mentioned grassroots efforts, this is, this is just it. I mean, if, if, if we were, there's no one that we could have waited forever to come in and do something about this. It's, it is, I'll just mention, well, as a result of doing this, I was approached by a couple of different groups to head up an effort to do something with the other eroding headstones in the cemetery. Because so many of them are brownstone, and yeah. the, you know, brownstone just chips, and yeah. it, just, it, it, just, it just disappears. But anyway, I just thought I would, uh, would, would mention that as something that, you know, what grassroots organizations uh, will do. And uh, once the newspaper wrote about this, there were people I didn't even know. They contacted me, wanted to give, a, you know, a few dollars for this. The former mayor of the town wrote a note and said, I think this is a wonderful idea. I want to be part of this effort. So the idea caught on that it was really important that this headstone ought to be preserved. So there it is. Thank a wonderful you. story. It's always good to hear, and thank you for sharing that, because it, we need to hear more uh, success stories, because this work is hard, and, and we got to keep people motivated. So yeah, thank you for thank doing you. that work. Yeah. I want to, um, to wrap up our program by giving each of you a, a chance to comment for a moment on um, what we need to do to make this happen. And um, Brent, I'll start with you because I think that the 
handbook that you wrote mm -hmm. gives such practical advice that someone that knew nothing about historic preservation yeah. could pick it up and say, here are the tools. Mm -hmm. Here's where I need to go. Let's talk a little bit about what has to happen in order to, to turn things around and, and save more sites. My big dream and big vision is to work with individuals that have real financial means and capacity to be able to raise 50 or $100 million where we can create a real national plan for saving the most important African-American historic places in the United States. So it's going to take uh, an organization like the National Trust to be a visionary and a leader in the diversity movement and in historic preservation. It's going to take additional uh, publications like this to continually educate people that are working at the grassroots level to be able to do this work uh, uh, well and to succeed. But we need financial resources. And I'm hoping that we can build a coalition of political advocates and foundations, corporate partners, and individuals that have the means to support this effort. It seems as though a few wealthy individuals could make a big difference by making a significant contribution that could, could then be matched. Yes. Um, yes. I'm thinking of a few people who. <laughs> All right, let's talk. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maisa, what, what has to happen uh, in Connecticut and in Bridgeport for your dream to come through? All right, what needs to happen is if you believe in national and African American historic sites, you need to say so. You need to write letters of support because there's a constant battle going on for these sites to just hold on to the land, to just hold on to the neighborhoods. And the, the political will isn't always there, no matter how amazing the site is, if it's not seen as something that is embraced and valuable to people beyond the neighborhood. So I can't tell you what it would mean to sites like ours to have letters of support to, that say, I'm from Hartford, <laughs> or I'm not African American, but this story is an amazing story because that's the only way that our politicians feel that they have the will not to redevelop entire neighborhoods and you find your site is um, in, endangered by that. But I just want to say that I want to give thanks to everyone who has stood by us. It's been an amazing journey. And for all of our ancestors who came before, sometimes I think Mar Mary and Eliza are nudging us. But you know, when you think that back then during slavery, they had the, they stood up and established these places, then we on our own level, we know that we can't stop fighting. Because I, I just want to tell one really quick story, but part of my family does a lot of um, genealogy, and we found our ancestor in the inventory of a white slave owner. And he gave my whatever great, 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 great grandmother to his daughter, and it said, and all of the issue for, of her womb throughout time for perpetuity. So during that same time that Mary and Eliza were writing their names on deeds, my father's side of the family, no one could see that for me there would ever be a free life. That man thought I would be owned by his daughter's daughter's daughter. Mm -hmm. And so that keeps us fighting. And if you would support us in that with letters of support, it would mean everything. Well, for people watching the show, where do they write the letters and where do they send them? OK, they can send the letters to the Freeman Center, 1070 Park Avenue, Bridgeport, Connecticut, 06604. All right. See if we can help with that. Thanks. Glenn, you have the last word today. <laughs> well, that may be where it's left, but uh, in, in terms of, um, of um, embracing this and, and uh, making sure this happens, I think we need to have the, the will. I think we need to really look at the grassroots efforts and, and maximize those and celebrate those. And uh, again, I, I really think that we have an opportunity now that we, the state is adopting a common core learning that we implement. Uh, and it gives real suggestions to our local school boards and, and, and those to let students think about these kinds of projects. That you know, here's a real need, and I think they'll make a, a solid connection if our if our young people begin to address these issues. And again, this is something they can build on year after year. So I think those are some things we can look at doing. And I think us, we, as leaders, need to really push that and get our young people to accept those ideas and let them understand that history never dies. History continues to grow. 
and we need to get that attitude and that, that, that idea across. Thank you so much, sure. Glenn Cassis, Lisa Tisdale. Brent Legs, thank you so much for being with us today. And I hope that uh, for everyone who came today that you'll tell your friends to uh, watch this program on CTN because I think we have a lot to learn, a lot to be inspired by. So thank you for being here today.